Hey folks, this here is an amalgamation of talks that I've been given over the last few months to help faculty uh, make sense of generative AI and its role in higher education as we navigate you know, into the future with this new set of tools that we're all trying to figure out. So let me frame this first by telling you a bit about me. Uh, I've been teaching since 2006 and I've probably taught around 120 to 130 college courses in a variety of disciplines because of my interdisciplinary background. Early on, I was doing full-time adjuncting, uh, and that led me into instructional design, because when you're teaching nine face-to-face -face courses and two online courses in a semester, you need to really make synergistic choices that utilize technology effectively. So in the last 12 years, I've worked at the intersection of technology and education at uh, a variety of places, including community colleges, small liberal arts colleges, research and universities, and the Ivy Leagues. Simultaneously, I've developed a deeper consideration and participation and participated in rich and complex conversations about the roles of technology in our world. And of course, in the last decade, the rise of movements like Black Lives Matter, Standing Rock, Me Too, and other organizations and communities have risen up to bring to our attention to the ways technologies can be both empowering and complicit in historical and contemporary violence towards BIPOC, LG, LGBTQIA, uh, people with disabilities, and other groups that have been pushed to the periphery. Those things too have made me think about my pedagogical practices, the technologies that I use, and the ways that I work with faculty. And of course, all of this led me to College Unbound, where I became the Director of Digital Pedagogy. And as a young and growing college still building its infrastructure, I have to think deeply about what technologies we bring into practice, given that we serve, a large, uh, serve largely an adult population that is more than 70% women of color. Being thoughtful about the possibilities and downstream effects of technology is particularly important for our students who are more often digitally surveilled and digitally redlined, and that is subjected to technology rather than agents of technology. When generative AI came onto the scene in December uh, 2022, Autumn Keynes, a good colleague and friend and faculty member at College Unbound, struck up a conversation with me about what she was seeing in our class. This led me to realize this led me to realizing that we had to figure out this technology for our students and our faculty. Ultimately, I put together a course called AI in Education, where myself and the students would explore generative AI within higher education and develop proposed usage policies of generative AI for students and faculty in courses. We created a policy and test piloted it and it's now being reviewed by faculty at this at this current moment at our institution before we move into having it implemented as an institutional policy. The course is an example of really thinking through with students as we consider the complexities of these tools. It's also because of this journey that I started uh, that I start this presentation with an equity acknowledgement to further ground our, this conversation. So this presentation was prepared using ChatGPT. I acknowledge that ChatGPT and many other generative artificial intelligent tools do not respect the individual rights of authors and artists and ignore concerns over copyright and intellectual property in the training of the system. Additionally, I acknowledge that this AI system was trained in part through the exploitation of precarious workers in the global south. Also, I recognize that the structure to support the expanse of AI rests on continued large-scale extraction of resources from environments and uh, in methods that have long effects on the local populations, and in the end, many of those resources, i.e. hardware, are often causing further harm in global climate change and environmental degradation particularly and directed directly for the global south and communities that are historically and presently marginalized. In this work, I specifically use ChatGPT as a collaborative exercise and to test out some ideas about its usage, better understand the tool and its uses in education. So thank you for sitting with me through, uh, through that and in this thoughtful consideration about generative AI. We're going to cover some ground uh, some of it will be familiar, some of it may be new, we won't have all the answers, but hopefully we'll surface and refine some of the questions that we're all asking. First, I'm going to show you some resources I've created for this. Uh, that link will send you there. I'll put it in the, uh, in the description, and I'll pull that up on screen too to get into it a little bit deeper. Second, 
we're going to talk a little bit how we got here, establish some base reality as it were. Then we're going to talk, probably have some real talk, about what many faculty are experiencing right now or have been over the last few months. Next, we're talking a little bit about these tools and what they are and what they are not. So we're trying to do a little bit of myth, myth busting. We're going to highlight some different approaches that faculty are trying and we'll end up with some tips and considerations about what to do next. So let's take a look at the resources. So when you go into that link, you're going to find a couple different things here that are, I hope are useful. The first is a link to the presentation deck uh, that I always try to provide. And a lot of this material is covered with a Creative Commons license for repurpose and reuse. Uh, then you're going to see a bunch of different resources that I've created over the last few months, everything from crowdsourced syllabi with, uh, with uh, crowdsourced syllabi with examples of uh, generative AI policies. Uh, you're going to see the strategy that we developed at College Unbound, uh, an example of a, a usage survey that we sent to students, uh, some blog posts, some videos, etc. You're going to see a bunch of things here. I encourage you to go and play around with those. And then these are different curated materials that I thought would be useful for uses of uh, effective uses of teaching AI, some general things about AI. If you're looking for some on online communities to learn more from, uh, and then some additional resources, and then finally some information about prompt creation. Uh, in fact, if you go further down, there's an entire prompt guide that I encourage you to take a look at, play around with, really use it to get familiar and understand the, the, the scope of generative AI. And then this area here, conversations in higher education, I'm going to talk about this later in this talk, but just know that it's further expanded in this space. Um, so that's a lot of the stuff here. The other thing I wanted to point out is this Q&A with ChatGPT4. Um, if you go to that document, it will bring you to uh, what is a 80 page document uh, where I asked ChatGPT a variety of questions and I captured their answers. And these are questions from teaching at community college to building out an accounting class, a composition class, theories of personality class, uh, instructions to pharmacology, just to give you a sense of the richness and the variety and the ways it provides answers, uh, the different types of questions you can ask to solicit information and ideas. Uh, and then I throw in some personal use questions. These are questions I've played around with and I've just found them really interesting of like, I can ask it to create a daily routine and turn that into a table. Uh, and then I can use that table and turn that into a uh, file that I can import into my Google Calendar. I also asked it a bunch of questions about planning out a garden uh, since I like to garden and I thought this would be an interesting way of showing like other things that you can do with it. So that's just to give you a sense of what these resources are. You can click on any of them and then you know click the link and it'll bring you right to it. Uh, there are, the questions are all highlighted so you can also just kind of scroll along as you want. But let's get back to the presentation. All right. So while ChatGPT is the most known among the generative AI tools, it is more like the catalyst. Uh, and there's been other generative AI tools around, uh, but you can think of ChatGPT kind of like the iPod. It wasn't the first MP3 player, but it was the one that got others thinking that put it on the map. And that's what ChatGPT is, the, the first generative AI tool that really put it on the map for everyone. Additionally, the big change here around artificial intelligence is that it's generative of image and text and video and audio. The generative part of generative AI is really the change is is really changing the game. Um, another piece of this new set of generative tools is that they keep they keep the ongoing context. That is, if you're asking ChatGPT question after question, later responses are impacted by previous questions and responses. That is, it keeps those contexts in calculating its responses. And note that I'm saying context in calculating responses and not saying recent, remembers or in uh, answering, right? That a lot of what we'll see here and that we'll talk a little bit about is uh, ChatGPT is calculating. It's not necessarily answering. And those are different things. So artificial intelligence has been around for decades and in, just in different capacities. You know, you use it when you do autocorrect or autocomplete. Uh, when you use voice automated tools like Siri or Alexa. Uh, some of you may be using it when you're you know, using a filtered background or filtered sound in Zoom. 
ChatGPT, though, felt different as a catalyst for much of what is to come in, uh, in a tangible way that hasn't been experienced before. The fact that the everyday user can access ChatGPT and use it yeah, to use it fairly easily to do things that they could not do before plays a large part in all of this. Uh, when ChatGPT arrived, it, there's also a piece of this that is like how quickly it has moved uh, within our culture. So when ChatGPT arrived in late November 2022, very quickly it got a lot of attention and interest. Uh, it gained some attention with a feature in the Atlantic that was about the death of the college essay but it still stayed off the radar uh, for many in higher education. Uh, but still, by the end of January, just two months after its launch, it had over 100 million users. And so as a point of reference to understand that, TikTok took nine months to get to 100 users, Instagram took 2.5 years, and Facebook 4.5. So, you know, in December, schools are wrapping up the semester, their you know their fall semester. They weren't really paying att much attention, and so there's a couple of folks that were having conversations about this tool and what it might mean. But it was really in January uh, when it hit higher ed, and they were just like, "Are you kidding me?" So some folks embraced it, but for many, including I guess folks you know watching this video, felt like it was one more thing uh, to throw our work into chaos. And that's the important thing to acknowledge here. It's not just the fact that it can challenge some of our ways of assessment or raises some of concerns about plagiarism, but that it comes at the end of a long train of technologies and pedagogies and world events that have asked, actually no, demanded, a faculty change much if not their entire practice, a practice that some have been working on for decades, and to change it in just a mere few days. ChatGPT feels like an enormous undermining of the work that many have been doing. So very quickly, the use, uh, you know, the uses of generative AI tools include so many things that we thought of as standards and felt deeply grounded in. The result is that people are shuffling about trying to figure out what to do next. Some folks are calling for a return of tests after years of moving away from these poor demonstrations of learning. Others are calling for more in-person demonstrations like oral exams. But this all feels reactionary in trying to avoid the bigger existential consideration that generative AI represents. This feels bigger and deeper for many of us, and I think I can speak to some of the why. For one thing, our primary means of demonstrating learning is upended and changed. There have been increasing cracks in mostly relying on written, written and uh, writing and presentations for a while, but this doesn't just fracture that, it shatters it. It feels very much like the vast majority of mental work that gets turned into tangible deliverables for evaluation in higher education is very quickly becoming possible to be generated by AI. The scenario I'm about to describe actually is possible right now in uh, early summer 2023, but not yet fully plausible. And that's, it, it, it's possible, but not yet though not fully plausible. Uh, but that's likely to change as we move forward semester by semester. And so this scenario falls somewhere along the continuum of, wow, it's super amazing and we live in the future. And it's super scary and we live in the future, right? So it is possible to have ChatGPT write a speech and put that into an AI slides generator like slides.ai and then use an AI voice cloner to read the speech. You could have that recorded and submitted for many online assignments for sure, or you could build out a YouTube channel or some other platform, right? So you're able to kind of do all of this with not, without that deeper work that we typically associate with these, these ways of, of creating um, information and knowledge. And that's bananas, right? Like this can all be done now in like 20 minutes or less. And so on a deeper level, there's many of us, you know, who have been teaching for years. And over these years, we have developed a deep and rich practice and philosophy of teaching where our courses are interconnected webs, where everything comes together in an alignment that we've been working on years to perfect. That alignment deeply interconnects with learning outputs by students that are directly thrown into the question, thrown into question as a result of generative AI. And that means to pull 
on that thread. Like, to pull on that thread means to unravel all that interconnected threads, all those interconnected threads. It means to feel like we're back on page one of teaching. And that is damn exhausting for many of us, because again, many of us were, were, were here during the pandemic, and just when things felt like they were, were going to return to normal, whatever we mean by that, we're hit with this. And I don't know that we fully appreciate the depth of the pain, fatigue, frustration, and yeah, even sadness. It feels like we're back at page one, and it feels even harder than the pandemic because there's ways we could share and support one another by sharing resources and the like. But teaching, teaching and our philosoph philosophical understanding of how we show up to a class is personal, so individual, and so deeply a part of our soul. That isn't just about a pivot, it's a paradigm shift. And the lift is hard, and scary, and exhausting. Before I did anything else here, I wanted to name and acknowledge that. I wanted to thank folks for continuing to show up, to be watching this video, to be thinking about how to still move forward. Because it's hard. You know, like this, I want to just sit with a moment around that. And so I'm going to ask folks, I know folks are watching this and you may be like, I'm not going to do that. And that's fine. But I want to ask folks, you know, to take a moment and close your eyes and do a deep inhale for a four count, right? One, two, three, and then a slow exhale for a six count. One, two, three five, six, and repeat this for two or more cycles. And as you're doing this, what do you notice in your body? What does the things that you notice, what does that tell you about what you're feeling right now related to all of this? All right, just, just do that inner check, kind of see where th you're feeling things arise. And I'm going to ask you to pause the video and write out your thoughts, your concerns, your questions. And then submit it, submit them in the comments. And where it makes sense, you know, I will reply directly or I'll make a new video. Uh, because I think this is also just giving some space for like, ugh, right? Like what is happening um, is an important part of all of this. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about what generative AI is. Um, generative AI is a complex technology and there's going to be a lot of ways that it infiltrates different industries and disciplines. And really, at Generative AI's core, it is advanced mathing, as a colleague of mine uh, who works in AI has said. What we are looking at is statistical probabilities based on a large language model that has studied the hell out of the, not even the words, but chunks of words, four to five long strings of text throughout those, and learned, or, or just really um, analyzed the relationships so that when somebody goes to ask a generative AI a question, it is both looking at that question and breaking it into those little chunks and studying the relation, the statistical relationships among those chunks, and then also the vast data that it has to produce an output that is statistically probably matching or in response. So it's not thoughtfully answering your question. It is just responding statistically based upon that large language model. And there's lots of concerns about what is contained in that large language model and who uh, who gets to understand and see that. And there's lots of questions about, you know, the bias of that pool, the bias of answers or how answers are shaped. But that's largely what we're dealing with here is advanced mathing. And it is going to disrupt and change the way we do many things. And if you look right now, it's, you can already see that taking shape in some places. And then also, it's not just about text. ChatGPT is the thing we're mostly all thinking about in this moment in time, but it's also audio and video and programming and so many other things that it will be able to create that, we, um, that we're not thinking about or that we don't even know what are the questions to ask or, or to think about. So what isn't generative AI? First and foremost, it is not a person or a sentient being. No matter what all those sci-fi novels and movies and comics and TV shows and Silicon Valley dude bros tell us, it is not a, like artificial intelligence is not an accurate name for what this is. 
Um, and we already see Apple is, is signaling that by trying not to use artificial intelligence, but by using a term uh, machine learning, right? Generative AI does not think, nor is it intelligent. And the very name is a misnomer. Um, it works on, st on statistical probability of chunks and bits of words based on a massive data set. Um, so we just want to keep that in mind. You know, whenever you hear that uh, that wrong answers are framed as lies or hallucinations or what have you, that's misleading language. That's giving you a sense of like uh, agency or like existence in something that is just working on probability. Um, it's not thinking through the answers in any conceivable way. And it also, AI isn't like, the, the rise of this doesn't mean it will replace all our jobs. Um, I do have thoughts on how it's going to impact our jobs and it's hard not to think that it won't impact our jobs. But, you know, it's not necessarily like, oh, you know, there go all of our jobs. I do think this is really important for faculty to consider is, you know, students that are graduating three months, six months, a year from now, this is going to be, ex some understanding of this is going to be expected. And so continuing to think about what is its role in your industry, in your discipline, because it will have a role. And anything you can do to think about that and support that is really important. I think for me, most importantly, especially when talking with faculty, is that AI, play, like, AI plagiarisms, plagiarism checkers, you know, there's a few out there, um, there's a few out there now that promise they can detect if AI is being used. Simply put, they do not work in any way that doesn't result in regular false positives of students. A lot of people are, are making a bucket full of money selling institutions a product that is inevitably going to accuse a lot of innocent students of cheating. And there's one thing that the sci-fi stories get right about technology. Once we see a technology at play, we often trust it over the individual. And that is exactly the wrong place we want to be in education. If you want to get a better understanding of how such AI tools and in in their problems manifest, look at the ways that AI is being used in criminal justice in the limitations or the concerns that that's drawing for a lot of people around inequity. Okay, so here we are. Uh, over the last six months, there's been this swirling and happening, you know, this conversation has been swirling around and happening in departments and division meetings across meals and classrooms and very much across the internet and blogs and podcasts, Twitter, Mastodon, Facebook, TikTok, all of it. Um, and so what I ho help, hope to do here is to kind of give you the contours of these conversations and help you think about where are you and where do you want to be. And so a few caveats before we get started. The first is that there are likely other conversations and more will be continuing to emerge, but these are the strongest that I'm currently seeing. Many are not mutually exclusive. That is, you know, as you think about your own your own situation, consider what makes you drawn from which ones make uh, from which ones. Uh, in which ones make sense. Don't feel like you can only be in one box. And I would say that there's not necessarily right or wrong conversations to be in or to take part of, though I think it's really important to be grounded in a firm pedagogical understanding of learning science before taking on too strong of a stance in any of them. So the first group is like what I call the, I just can't. These are the folks who, this feels so overwhelming. There's so many other things going on that there, there's a sense of paralysis. There's a sense of like, I am, I am not ready to have this conversation. There's folks who are just saying, not in my class. And this is kind of a very clear statement of, if you use this, like, there is no room in my class for you to use this at all. And if I find out there are consequences. There's the academic honesty group. These are the folks who see this perfectly paired under the, the idea of academic honesty um, and fits in with traditional views of plagiarism. And that's just how they're going to look at it and frame it. There's folks who are using it as a tool within their classroom and engaging with students about how they use it, uh, thinking about what it means and bringing students in to play around with it 
or finding ways that they can use it in that classroom for further teaching and learning. Then there's the instructor's tool. And these are folks who are using it in their role as instructor. So they might be using it to help begin the first draft of a syllabus. They might be using it to actually come up with examples. This is one of the things I think about and appreciate is like it can be an infinite example creator. You can use this to create those examples that you're always wanting students to have but never have the time to create. There's the critically engaging folks, and these are folks who are looking at these sets of tools, thinking about how they relate to their discipline or their industry, and coming up with a robust, centri a robust discussion about uh, artificial intelligence and its role. And they're doing so through lenses of equity and justice and, um, and just, you know, what does this really mean for us in a way that is we should be concerned about. And then there's the student voice. And this is what I certainly did at College Unbound, which is like, in order to really even think about how we're going to use this, students need to be involved. They need to be part of the conversation and not apart from the conversation. As I mentioned earlier, all of the, like, so I, I gave brief descriptions here, but if you want more details, the handout uh, or the resource that I mentioned that's also in the description, uh, you can find a bit, few more details about like the benefits and the challenges of each of these. All right, so what does all this mean for your practice? What, it, what do, you know, what are, how then do you proceed if all of this is true? What are some things to think about? The first and most challenging is that there's no silver bullet. Even before this, there was no silver bullet to solving all of the things that we have to navigate in the classroom. And nothing is going to save us from AI. It's here and we have to navigate. It's gonna exist. And so we, you know, there's no way for us to think or to hold out like something different is gonna happen. I think there's an important piece here of um, accepting the seating of control. This is something that is going to be hard for a lot of us, but, you know, prior to this, you know, we, we felt like we had, we had certain range of control of things. I think generative AI comes in and challenges the degree to which we can control certain things within our classroom. And I know a lot of people feel challenged by that. I also feel like there's something powerful and I am appreciative of, you know, whenever we're in spaces where students have more power, that means we have to find other means to work together. And that means building trust and building relationships. And I think that's really important in a way that we don't always recognize in education. Find your people, go out into the world, find your people in your discipline, people that teach in similar ways. There are amazing and rich conversations going on all over the place right now. Um, if you want to learn more from others, like if you want to learn what other people are doing, if you want to enhance or try to figure this out, find people in your discipline, find other teachers and, and have those conversations. It's really important. Within all of this, it's really important for you to figure out where you are and where you aren't and give yourself some space to like explain or articulate or identify that so that you know like what you can and can't do and don't overextend yourself and don't undersell yourself. Think about where you sit within all of this. Make sure you use it. Try it out, play with it. Use it for at least 30 minutes. Read some information about prompting and really play with prompting and really try to be, look at other people's prompts, look at the prompt guide that I provide in the resources and really try to look at what are the things you can do with this? And what might you be able to do with this as an instructor? How might you be able to leverage this for teaching and learning in your course? Play with prompts. Prompts, there's a lot of rich prompt guides out there. I provide some myself. Play around with them, learn how to engage with this tool and just think about what it means to ask questions. And that is, I think, something in any discipline is really valuable, how to ask meaningful questions. And so there's a way we can play with ChatGPT. Um, that is also helping students think about how do I ask important, effective, clear, communicative, con context setting questions. Um, so keeping an eye out for that and thinking about how playing with prompts can also play a role in your class and help you understand further these tools. 
think about where it makes sense to use this as a tool in the teaching and learning process. Uh, does it make sense in part of the course construction? Does it make sense in creating um, activities or feedback or examples or a rubric? Like, there's lots of different ways you can do it. Just figure out where it makes sense for you to try something. Um, you don't have to go all out, but think about where you're going to try something here. Talk to your students about it. Talk to them both to understand how they look at it, how they play with it. Do they know about it? How are they using it? How do they want to use it in your course? How do you want them to use it in your course? Um, but start that conversation. Acknowledge the elephant in the room that this is a tool that has arrived that changes a lot of different things. And both by doing that and in general, thinking about how you build community and trust. Stu you know, a lot of what we're going to see here is students using the tool in part because they don't think they can, because it's easier, because it's quicker, because they're afraid of failure, like all these different things. And they're going to do that because they don't have a connection to you or to the course. And so really thinking about how do you build connection? How do you build community? And how do you really resonate with them about what you're doing there together as you go forward? And then finally, include students. Uh, I always go back to Jesse Stommel's uh, four word pedagogy with uh, start by trusting students. And so as you start to figure this out, it's not just you're talking to your students, but you're including them, working with them to think about what makes sense for this course, for this group of people in this space. How do we use this tool appropriately in a way that supports one another in learning, um, as opposed to just everybody going through the moves? So those are really the things that I can encourage you to think about for your practice, things for you to think about as you go forward. Um, and I hope this video is helpful. I hope it's incent it, you know, it, it gives you some ideas, some things to think about, some clarity about what this is, what this isn't, and hopefully some really good resources for you to further learn more and start to play around with. Um, I hope this is helpful. If it is, you know, always feel free to leave comments in the chat or if there's additional things that you want to see. All right. Thank you so much.